you know, he brought us back into his office. Um, he put his hand on my knee. He said, now you're stage four. This is going to kill you. And that was um, extremely sobering. My brain was just whirling. And, um, and we both cried pretty much all the way home. Um, and, and a lot of it was about the kids. A lot of it was they're, they're going to lose their mom at such a, a young age. I style myself a recovering lawyer. Uh, I have had a legal license for uh, 20 years this year, but um, certainly had to learn how to take care of myself in a very different way. Um, I'm a mom. I have two boys. They are now seven and nine as we sit here talking in 2022 and um, a husband. Um, I love the Enneagram, which is a, a personality uh, type uh I guess, way of understanding motivations. And so I uh, very much resonate with type eight, which is sometimes called the challenger. Um, and that's kind of what I tend to do is I tend to challenge systems. Um, I definitely have learned a lot in the last 20 years about being an advocate and it's kind of in my DNA. Thank you for sharing all of that, Abigail. And, and today we'll be diving into your metastatic breast cancer story. Uh, which there's so many different areas to cover here. So I'm going to ask, what were the first signs? Um, I know for you, it was too early for the regular screening or any of that sort of thing. What got you to, to figure out, oh my gosh, something's wrong and led to that first diagnosis? Yeah, so I was 38 when I was diagnosed and typically they don't begin mammograms until 40. Um, because my mother is a breast cancer survivor, I could have gotten mammograms beginning at 36, but I was pregnant and nursing. And so they don't, the, the mammogram itself um, doesn't see as well into the breast when the milk is, is there. So it kind of clouds the image. Um, so it wasn't recommended by my primary care physician. Um, so looking back um, in 2016, I began having a lot of pain in my back and in my legs. Um, now I understand that that was, that was the metastasis that had spread to my bones, but I was a mom. I was tandem breastfeeding at that point. My kids were one and three. I had a million things going on. I was running my law firm. You know, you don't prioritize yourself. I think as a mom, your health, that sort of thing, which definitely want to say that that's so important for us moms to, to listen to our bodies, to go to the doctor when things are wrong to ask the questions that need to be asked because I don't know if if I had been diagnosed sooner if things would have been different but um, you know certainly by the time I was diagnosed it had progressed to um, a very significant disease load but anyway end of 2016 I was in a fair amount of pain and then the beginning of 2017 in January I felt a lump in my left breast now because I was tandem nursing and pumping every two to three hours and had been doing that for four years. Um, I was certainly very familiar with my breast tissue, um, but because of all of the nursing, I also had more tissue than, than I would normally. And so um, I think that the, the lump, even though it was relatively close to the surface, I didn't really fully grasp what was going on for a bit, thought it was a clog, went to my lactation consultant, interestingly enough, the cancer in my body happened in my breast exactly where I'd had clogs. And the same thing happened to my mom. So that the, the areas where the tumors were that they found when she had her DCIS um, uh, diagnosis almost 20 years ago now, um, it was exactly in the places where she had clogs. So definitely something to think about if, if you're a nursing mom that um, to pay attention to those areas of your body and make sure that your doctors are paying attention to them as well. No one really treats 
your breast when you're breastfeeding. You know, your PCP might know something, the pediatrician knows some things, uh, the OBGYN knows some things, but there's no, there's not really somebody who's um, really talking about your breast, especially when you're nursing, except for lactation consultants, but not every practice, medical practice has those. So Abigail, you know, so you're, 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 you're going to the lactation consultant. What happened next to really figure out what was going on? So she touched the area and said, eh, it's probably nothing. This was something that was consistent across the medical providers that I saw. But I'd really like you to just go to your primary care physician and ask her. Now, I had actually picked a primary care physician who not only personally tandem breastfed her children, but also had an extra lactation certification. Again, there aren't those doctors that treat you when when you are nursing. And so it, it took a bit for me to find somebody, but I had. And so this was literally my second appointment with this particular doctor come in and uh, she said very similarly to the lactation consultant, 95% sure this is absolutely nothing, but since you've never had a mammogram and because of my mother's history of cancer, um, she sent me for my very first mammogram. Now, let me say too, my mother had breast cancer when they really only knew about the BRCA one and two. And so when she did genetic testing, which she did immediately because they're, um, I'm the oldest of six and there's three girls. So of course she was very concerned about us because she was BRCA negative. We thought, oh, we're in the clear. Well, in 2013, they updated the panel of genes that they know to look for to 40. And now that almost 10 years later, we're at 92. And so if anybody has had genetic testing prior to 2013, you really should get it redone. And and honestly, my mother doesn't remember being prompted to redo it in 2013, but uh, she didn't. And um, we later found out in in my breast cancer experience that we carry a germline mutation, ATM, like literally like you get money from the ATM, but ATM is part of your DNA that's responsible for repair. And so if there's a mutation in the part of your DNA that's supposed to repair mutations, clearly that can be an issue. Um, so we, we didn't find that out un, until later, but I am so grateful that um, instead of what happens to a lot of young women under 40, where their doctors say, oh, you're too young to get breast cancer, it's probably a cyst, it's probably this, don't worry about it. My doctor said, let's double check. And so I went for that very first mammogram appointment. They were very unhappy with me because of course, as soon as they squished my breast, milk went everywhere. Um, so the machine was covered in milk, but um, they did a mammogram and they did a diagnostic ultrasound. And I didn't, it, I didn't really connect to how serious it was that the radiologist came in and wanted to do a biopsy right then. Um, didn't, I mean, you know, to me, I was like, oh, you just want to follow up right now. But my doctor had said, if they wanted to do a biopsy that she wanted me to go to a specialist and the specialist that ended up doing my biopsy was both a breast surgeon and a radiologist. And so she was able to do all of it and then did my surgery. And so I, the following Monday, I was in the surgeon's office getting a biopsy, um, which was a very interesting experience. I'm very thankful my husband went went with me. Um, And it was, so that would have been, this was all like uh, January, February, Um, but it was April 8th of 2017 when I went back to get the results of the biopsy and they confirmed that it was breast cancer. So yes, it took a while. And one of the reasons that it did was because my insurance company only contracted with one lab and they were significantly backed up and it was across the state. So there was mailing things back and forth and all of that. Yes. So one of the very big lessons I learned right at the beginning was it is not our doctors that run our medical care. It is the insurance companies. I do want to double click on one thing, which is you talking about the biopsy experience being interesting and you're so glad your husband was there. And you don't have to get into the, maybe the nitty gritty or the weeds, but what is important to, for people to understand about, I'm, I'm curious why you use the word interesting and also why it was important for your husband to be there. I, I think that, well, okay. So I literally got a primary care physician after we got married because I'd never had a primary care physician. I went to urgent care if 
I had something serious and I had my OBGYN that I went to every year. I, I really just didn't engage with the medical system all that much. Thank God I was healthy. So kind of my first introduction to medical things was the fertility experience, which was terrible because it was just so emotional. Um, and it was invasive and, you know, it, it, having vaginal ultrasounds every other day for weeks on end, so not fun. So um, I think one of the big things that was interesting about the, the biopsy experience is one, it was done in my doctor's office. So I didn't have to go to like a surgery center or anything like that. Um, it was ultrasound guided. So, you know, I'm, I'm laying on the table, you know, fully exposed, which then was kind of an issue. Now is totally not an issue. Um, but they, you know, there was a person holding the ultrasound wand and then the doctor was, you know, had the, you know, it's like a, a, a long needle with a little uh, grabber thing on the end where it actually sounds like a click when they actually grab the piece of tissue. Um, and so there was some pain um, because yes, they used uh, lidocaine to, to numb the area, which lidocaine shots are not fun to get either. Um, and, you know, it was just something that was so, I felt so vulnerable probably for one of the first times in that, it, you know, in, in a doctor's office, you know, have them doing a procedure right there where I hadn't had time to prepare. So all of the other testing that I had Somebody explained it to me and then I made the appointment and I had time to kind of, you know, assimilate what was happening. This was like, oh no, we need to do this biopsy right now. Oh, okay. Um, and then I, I leaked milk and blood from the site of the biopsy for a, about a week afterwards. Um, she had to biopsy a couple of my lymph nodes. The lymph nodes turned out to be full of milk, not cancer, just milk. Um, but I, I got to watch on the ultrasound screen, you know, as she was doing it and she narrated and um, it was just, it was a, a very different experience, different from anything that I had ever experienced in the past, um, previous to that. And then I think I was still a little bit in denial at, at that moment. Um, my, my husband and I, my father-in-law just passed away, but we had cared for him. So my husband had been his caregiver as, as a young professional for about 10 years, I think, before he went into the nursing home, he had three, three strokes. And so I'm so thankful that my husband was much more in tune with, okay, this is serious. Yes, we need to do this right now. Um, you know, I had meetings. I think I had, you know, client meetings and things like that. And I wanted to leave. And he's like, no, 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 no. We have to do this now. So he was very good at knowing that it was serious enough to do something, I think I was a little emotionally disconnected from the experience at that at that point. <laughs> well, you had no idea what was going on. And also no one wants to be leaning into the thought that, oh, this is going to definitely be cancer, right? This is just some little thing. They just need to figure it out. And then I can be on my merry way and continue life. At what point then did you realize that that was not going to be the case? It was not going to be this one blip in time and that there was something more serious that you had to address. So April 8th of 2017 was when we found out it was breast cancer. And I think then we actually still thought it was going to be a, you know, go through treatment and be done. I mean, I had my mother's experience to compare with and, um, you know, she is amazing and worked all the way through chemo and radiation and, and everything else, had a double mastectomy, did all the things that you need to do. And she is still... Um, no evidence of disease now, you know, almost 20 years later. So I had her experience to think about. And so we really thought at, in April of 2017 that it was going to be a situation where I went through treatment and then we could put breast cancer in the rearview mirror. Um, and so when we found out in, in that um, appointment that it was cancer, I left that appointment with an appointment with the medical oncologist, an appointment with the radiation oncologist. and. Um, plastic surgeon, et cetera. Like I had all these appointments to learn about all these people that were going to be on my team. And I, you know, I am so thankful that my introduction to this whole experience was someone who said, I have other doctors that I work with very closely. We text each other and she's texting the different doctors to get me in, 
you know, the next day to see the various different doctors to talk about treatment options and, and things of that nature, which um, I didn't know at the time how, how amazing that was, that she was so careful to look at everything full circle. Now, the only fly in the ointment, looking back at, at that initial experience is that we did genetic testing at that point, but she only did BRCA1 and 2. And so, you know, here, here we go again with the, you know, um, my mother didn't get retested. And then this surgeon was only looking at BRCA1 and 2, did not do the full genetic panel. Now, I understand that it is hard sometimes to get those things covered by insurance, especially when you're at the, the very beginning of, of these breast cancer experiences. But now when I talk to newly diagnosed people or people who are beginning this um, process is to insist on the full genetic panel because BRCA1 and 2 are not the only genes that are associated with breast cancer. There are 93 now that, that they look at and that can change your treatment um, because your risk there, there's literally an algorithm where they plug in all the different details and your risk changes when you have a genetic, a cancer that's associated with a, a genetic mutation, which is still only 12% of breast cancer. Uh, you know, I, I really remember the radiation oncologist literally spent two hours with us. The medical oncologist spent about an hour. I, all these doctors were so kind and caring and it was a, a good introduction to something terrible. Um, I had my lumpectomy. We decided on a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. Um, legally, um, an insurance company is required to cover a mastectomy if the patient wants it, as well as reconstruction. No um, insurance company can refuse to cover those things. Um, and so my doctor literally was like, all of these options are yours. Um, she also connected me with a couple of her patients who had had different surgeries, which I thought was amazing. I haven't heard of other doctors doing this, but she connected me with somebody who had had a lumpectomy and somebody who had a mastectomy and somebody who had a double mastectomy. And that was very helpful because I could, you know, compare and contrast their, their different experiences. And, and um, what were your takeaways since you were making this decision? What went into the decision of what to pursue and how did hearing from these three different people help you? So I think the, 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 there's always pros and cons and, and everybody is individual, right? My mother had a double mastectomy um, and then did reconstruction. And, you know, she had a couple of issues where they had to go back and, and redo things. One was a whole surgery where she got the scar tissue tightened up and they had to go in and loosen it. So I had that experience knowing that she had gone through that. And so my, honestly, my biggest issue at that point in time was recovery time. And I, I didn't want to have to be in uh, having multiple procedures. And so at the time, because we didn't know yet that I was stage four, and we thought that this was going to be an experience, you know, go through it, be done, and it be in our rearview mirror, I opted for a, they called it an oncoplasty reduction. And so basically what they did was they did the lumpectomy, lumpectomy to remove the cancer. They took tissue from my right breast to fill in the hole or the divot. Um, because it was a pretty big um, area that they had to remove. And, and then I got a lift and, you know, all, all of the, those fun, good, nice things to have everything look aesthetically the same. Um, so that was important to me then, the aesthetics, the um, how much I would have to be in various surgeries, how long it would take. I, I really wanted to be finished as soon as humanly possible with the the, the medical side of things. Cause I thought, Hey, I got to get back to work. I got to get back to doing the things that, that we're doing. Um, so I had my lumpectomy in, um, June of 2017. It was pushed off a little bit because that particular surgery, there were only two, um, plastic surgeons that knew how to do it with my surgeon and I had to dry up my mouth. So my doctor literally handed me a paper, like two or three things to do. And she said, oh, in about a week, you'll have no more milk. Yeah, I had been nursing and pumping every two to three hours for four years straight. And it took a whole heck of a lot longer than one week for my milk to dry up. And um, one of the things that they needed to do was do an MRI 
to be sure that there was no cancer in my right breast. And so we had to get the milk out of the way so that those imaging, um, those images would be effective and would be reliable. Um, and I, I have to say that outside of being told that I had cancer, the abrupt weaning of both of my boys was probably the most traumatic thing that happened. Um, my almost four-year-old, we had already been talking like on his fourth birthday, he um, turned four in March that year that he would be done. And he was really only nursing to sleep and it was just comfort and that sort of thing. Um, my two-year-old screamed um, every night for at least a week. Um, so that was, that was a terrible experience of, uh, of drying up my milk and of, you know, abruptly weaning. We always thought weaning was going to happen on our terms. Um, but I think it also, in a sense of foreshadowing, it gave me a sense of the things that I was going to have to give up as part of this experience. It gave me some foreshadowing of how our lives were irrevocably changed. Um, there was no more just deciding and making decisions based on you know what we wanted, it had to now encompass this whole other element of that of my health and treatment and, and all of those things. Um, you know, I hadn't had a lot of scanning then yet, but um, you know, I get PET scans every three months and I'm radioactive for at least 24 hours, depending on which isotope and the half-life and all that. So I have to stay away from my kids overnight, typically after a PET scan, because they don't know how radiation affects a growing body, right? So there's just all these things that you you never think that it's going to have to have those adjustments. Anyway, so the tissue that they pulled out, the lumpectomy went great. It was like a seven hour or something surgery, got to go home the same day. It was actually um, a great recovery. Um, you know, I, it, it was it was a big change. Uh, I went from double D to A, <laughs> so that was a, a very big change, but I was normally like an A, almost a B cup, so um, nursing definitely gave me more more tissue than, than I had uh, normally, but that was a big adjustment too. Clothes fit differently, um, you have to wear those awful uh, compression garments for the first weeks and that sort of thing, so that was a big adjustment, but I was still working, still trying to have as much normalcy as possible. And actually um, really quickly, I, yeah. I've gone to ask when they had given you, you know, the diagnosis the first time around, what, how did they describe it in terms of stage and any other details they gave you about what it was? So um, my doctor was, um, it was perfect for me because she was just very direct and she just said things and it, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of packaging or hemming and hawing. It was okay. It came back. It's breast cancer. It's hormone positive, strongly hormone positive. At that point, we didn't have the HER2 status because they had to do the extra testing. Um, but she, I still have the paper where she like drew where it was. Um, I had a, a tumor and then like a, an empty spot. And then like it would look like the, the cancer was um, developing a second tumor. So it was kind of this weird, um, almost two tumors. But, um, you know, they, at that point, she said, most likely I was stage two because of the size of the tumor. Um, and at that point, I had not talked about any of the other symptoms I was having. And so there, there wasn't any sense that there was, um, it had spread anywhere at that point. Um, and then when we did the lumpectomy, they did, um, th so they, they took four lymph nodes. Now, this is one thing that I learned from my mother. When they do lymph node dissections and they take 26, 30 lymph nodes out of your body, that compromises your lymphatic system in such huge ways. My mom is a physical therapist. Um, she said, you know, at that point, they were already going to do chemo. And she said, if you take all those lymph nodes, will that change my treatment plan? They said, no. And she said, no, thank you. <laughs> So, so what we did for me was um, they injected dye. So they, they um, injected dye around the nipple in the four quadrants. And then under a, um, I think it was an ultrasound or it might've been a different type of imaging. Anyway, they watched to see the first four lymph nodes that the dye went to. And those are called sentinel nodes. So those are the first lymph nodes that um, would be processing any kind of um, 
fluid that came from the breast area. And so they took those four during my surgery, um, tested them, and they were determined to be node negative. And so the typical spread of cancer is from the breast through the lymphatic system into other areas of the body. In about 5% of us, of course, I always fall in these weird percentages, um, it, it has spread through the blood before it ever really recruits the lymphatic system. Nobody knows why that is, but statistically and generally, if you are node negative, um, that typically is something that doctors then say, okay, you don't have to worry about the cancer having metastasized. And so because I was node negative, they initially staged me at 2A. And then they sent off the, the tissue, the tumor uh, cancer tissue from my lumpectomy to have genomic testing done. So I talked about genetic testing. That's your DNA, that's your blood, that's what you get from your family. Um, genomic testing is to look at the characteristics specifically of the cancer, see what kind of mutations it has, et cetera. And the test came back that um, it's called an oncotype test. Um, there's oncotype and mammoprint. They're basically the same thing, just two different companies. And they look at your, and they're able to score based on your uh, different markers, your risk of reoccurrence. Um, and my risk of reoccurrence came back in the gray area, which is super weird knowing now that I was already stage four at that point. But it was high enough in the gray area that um, uh, at, at the time, the gray area for me at my age, um, it was 27 and it, um, it was 25 to 30 was the gray area. That's no longer the gray area <laughs> now over 25 is recommended for chemo. They, they keep learning, which is so good. Um, but my doctor said, yes, I wasn't at 30, which would have made me in the high risk area, but his personal, um, definitely get chemo recommendation began at 25. And so because I was 27, he said, um, you should consider chemo. Um, the report that we got said that if I did chemotherapy, that it would reduce my risk of reoccurrence by a little over 20%. And for my husband and I, that, that was enough of a percentage that it made sense to go through chemo. Um, and so we scheduled uh, chemo and that was adriamycin and cytoxin. Adriamycin is often called the red devil. Um, I would do four uh, rounds of adriamycin and cytoxin. And then at that point, we, I was gonna do 10 rounds, or I'm sorry, 12 rounds of Taxol after that. And then radiation, that was, that was the plan, the treatment plan. So, my, the nurse in my doctor's office made a mistake and checked the box for them to check my tumor markers at my first chemo session. Uh, tumor markers are various proteins that are given off um, and uh, are in the blood when cancer is spreading. It was a mistake. It's not standard of care. You know, doctors, even a lot of doctors don't even look at tumor markers. Um, and so in June, I started, I had my first chemo session. And my doctor called me the day afterwards and said, there's something amiss with your blood work. We want you to do a, a bone scan and a CT scan. And I was told, I mean, I was popped up on Benadryl and all of the other pre-meds they give you. And so again, didn't like freak out. I was like, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> more, more tests, more scans. Um, my doctor had already offered me a PET scan um, or, I had asked about the PET scan and he said, you know, it's hard to get them approved by insurance, but we'll do it if you want it. And, um, you know, he didn't seem very concerned about doing scanning. So I was like, oh, okay. And didn't push it. I, I don't not push anymore because I think my intuition was telling me we needed to get more information. So I went in for the, um, uh, the bone scan and the CT scan. It was like a whole day at the hospital, I, I vividly remember like I'm having client consults and I'm drafting pleadings and you know doing all these things from the, the waiting area. And then we got the call uh, June 22nd of 2017 and the doctor said, or the, the nurse who called said, um, you just need to come in, it doesn't matter when, just come. And uh, I was in the middle of preparing for a hearing and was totally distracted and called my husband and said, that's a weird phone call. Like they're not even making me make an appointment. You don't need to go. I'm sure it's nothing. 
And thank God my husband had the presence of mind because of his experiences with his father that that's not normal. <laughs> Doctors don't say just come whenever you can get here, we'll, we'll see you. Um, and so he actually took me to, uh, that was the last hearing that I conducted as um, a practicing attorney. And uh, I won, of course, you know, just have to always include that. Um, my husband took me to the hearing and then we drove up to my doctor's office. And, um, you know, what's funny is that the medical oncologist, I didn't really like him the first time we met him. He was very like, you're going to do X, you're going to do Y. And I kind of bristled at that. It was kind of like, what? You're going to tell me what to do? Um, but in hindsight, he was the perfect doctor to have broken that news to us. And so, you know, he brought us back into his office. Um, he put his hand on my knee. He said, now you're stage four. This is going to kill you. And that was um, extremely sobering. Um, it was totally out of the blue. We had totally not expecting that. Um, I had a five centimeter tumor in the middle of my right femur. Um, my breast tumor was only about 2.4 centimeters. It was bigger in my leg than it was in my breast. Um, they were worried that my bone was going to shatter. And so um, my first thought after he said this was, my kids aren't going to remember me. They had turned two and four at that point. And, um, you know, he started giving some statistics, which he was very careful to say, you know, you are not a statistic, statistics are not everything. I have patients that have been living for, you know, 10, 15 years with metastatic disease, but this is a serious situation. Um, he's, because I had bone only met metastases at that point, there were only, it had only spread to the bones. There was some data that that was a longer life expectancy than if cancer was in your organs. And so he shared that with us. Um, and he was just very, he was very kind. And he let us ask all the questions. Um, of course, I tried to pin him down onto like, you know, okay, what, what is the timeline? Um, it's like, okay, okay, so I get 10 years, right? And he's like, well, some people do. Um, he was very, it was a very good balance of hope and reality. Um, you know, he, we had talked about, you know, he was going to manage me being on tamoxifen, which is, you know, you typically a hormonal medication that you're on after you finish chemotherapy, when you have early stage breast cancer, he said, now we're going to be talking about totally different medications. Right. Um, be before we go too yeah. far down that road, you had already been diagnosed with cancer. You had a plan. You were working. You were just going to go to this appointment. Do you remember the feeling being there, like, you know, for the, this, this second and more real diagnosis, um, sort of describe what was going through. I, I appreciated that first thought about the kids, but you know, anything else that you can remember about how did you even process it? What were you feeling and thinking at the time? So I think partly because of my training and partly because of my personality, I tend to think about something first and then the feelings come later you know, I, I was thinking much more about the nitty gritty of, okay, this was going to be the plan, but now, now that's all blown out of the water. And it was a lot of like trying to assimilate and understand like, okay, well, what's going to happen now? Um, you know, I vividly remember he sent in his social worker who was like, you know, 22, right out of college. And she was like trying to talk to us about how we felt about things. And we were both just like, like now is not the time. Like we're, we're overwhelmed with all of this. Um, you know, we, we got into the car and we told my husband, I was like, there's, I can't drive. Like, you know, you, you have to drive. Cause I was just, my brain was just whirling. And, um, and we both cried pretty much all the way home. Um, and, and a lot of it was about the kids. A lot of it was they're, they're going to lose their mom at such a, a young age. Um, one of my first thoughts was I have to protect them against the crazy stepmother that my husband's going to marry this other woman and there's going to be other kids. And, you know, I mean, your brain goes to so many weird places when you have a trauma like that. Um, I don't think that my executive functioning was fully online. Um, I think, you know, I was just kind of bouncing all, all over the place. Um, and it took about 
it, it took about a, a week, I think, for, for things to really marinate and for us to really wrap our heads around things. Of course, I was in surgery within a week to get titanium rods put in both beamers. And so there was a ton of appointments as well. But, you know, we, we had a business, my, my law firm, we had employees, I had a roster of clients. And so there was a lot of, a lot of the, okay, I have to take care of all these different pieces before I can even focus on, on what's going on with, with me. Um, it was about a week or so, maybe two weeks after the diagnosis, I started seeing a psychiatrist because I realized very quickly that the coping mechanisms that I had developed over my 38 years of living, they, they were not up to the task of dealing with this huge um, diagnosis. And so um, sought out mental health treatment and got on medication pretty much right away to manage anxiety, to manage, I mean, the, to say that there was depression, those dark nights of the soul when you are just thinking about the end of your life. I mean, that, that was what I obsessed over. Um, for the first couple of weeks. And so um, getting all those different pieces of, of support, um, my parents came up. Um, they We lived in Orlando when I was diagnosed. My parents were in Miami, so they they came up. Um, and, you know, my mom was with me in the hospital, you know, spending the night after um, uh, surgeries. And um, I didn't fully grasp how serious things were, I think, until we were in the, well, I mean, you know, I did on some level, but it became so real when we were in the orthopedic surgeon's office and he pulled up my scans. I had not looked at my scans. Now I look at everything. <laughs> but at that point, I was relying on the doctors to tell me what was going on and what was in the scans. And so he pulled it up and it was a picture of my, my right femur. And, you know, on an x-ray, your bone is supposed to be white, right? That, that, that's the color it's supposed to be. Um, mine was mostly black or, or it looked that way to me because there was so much cancer. Um, and you know, if you think about your bone being round um, or, or three-dimensional, like this much of the bone was full of cancer in, in that area where, where the tumor was concentrated. So there was only really one on the x-ray, and it's two-dimensional too, but on the x-ray, it looked like there was only really one area of the bone that was still solid. And so um, that one of the, the nurses actually like wouldn't make eye contact with me through the whole appointment. And she told me later that it was because, um, and of course I had, I had started chemo, I was bald, I was, you know, I did not look healthy. Um, she told me later that it was just really triggering for her because her sister had just been diagnosed with cancer and she she made me this bracelet and she was, it was very kind, but I did not fully connect with how serious it was really until that moment. Um, and I didn't fully understand even some of the conversations that were going on among my doctors because um, one of my friends actually saw my radiation oncologist uh, recently and she expressed some amount of surprise that I was still alive. Um, so I think that the disease load, because it was in every bone and because every bone was liberally sprinkled with cancer, um, all through my spine, it was in my, my, both humeruses, but I know my, my legs were the worst. And obviously you need your femurs to, to walk, to remain upright. Those are kind of important bones. Um, that was the focus. So I found out on a Friday about my diagnosis. The following Friday, I was in surgery to have the titanium rods put in both femurs. Um, and so we decided to finish the adromycin and cytoxin, you know, save the taxol for later. Um, and, 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 oh, and then we scheduled my hysterectomy too. When did you allow yourself, if you were able to at all? Um, I know there was that first cry in the car with your husband, but when did you allow yourself? Did you find you had to be intentional about letting yourself sort of grieve in the moment as you were, was that possible? And if you could also just talk about, I mean, you were this like, you know, attorney and go-getter and having to grieve part of that too, maybe. I don't know if that came then or it was later. Yeah, there's a lot of grief when it comes to uh, any cancer diagnosis, just because I think that you go from being a healthy person generally to somebody who is 
it's a betrayal, right? Your body has betrayed you in, in a lot of ways. And I think that really resonated with me a lot at the beginning. And um, I did what I think a lot of people tell you not to do, which is I went online and certainly there was Google, but then I found, um, you know, through some of the ladies that I talked to that my surgeon had um, sent me to and my mom, because she had been through um, treatment as well, you know, finding different support groups and finding other people to, to talk to. And, um, you know, I, I found a bunch of support groups. Um, one thing that was extremely traumatizing was one of the support groups I joined probably two, three weeks after I found out I was stage four, uh, three of their members died in like the week that I joined. And, and that was so sobering and overwhelming. And, um, you know, I don't know that I really did process things very well initially. It was not until things died down a little bit. So I, um, at some dear friends of mine, we transitioned my clients and a lot of my staff to um, their firm. And so it was a, it was a good transition for the, the they you know, practiced very similarly to me and all of that. It was a lot to undo all of the contracts. I, I moderate now a, a Facebook group that is specifically geared towards the newly diagnosed. So we take the people in the first two years of MBC diagnosis and, and really mentor and model for them kind of onboarding them into the MBC community and then get them into other groups and let them graduate. Um, because of those initial experiences that a lot of us have had, because death is such a constant in the MBC community, it, it happens. And so finding the coping skills and finding the ability to handle that, you know, I, I'm still not good at it. It's, it's been five years and I'm still not good at it, but I have more coping skills um, now. A lot of it has to do with these key people that have the same disease that we can really just talk frankly about what's going on um, and, and support groups where, where that's facilitated and that's helped in, in addition to the direct connection. And I know it's very personal and everyone has their own process, but you've sure. been, you know, you've been doing this for a few years now. Yeah. What has helped you with the, with the thought of the kids? So our parenting style has always been to be as open and honest as possible with our kids on the correct developmental level. And so one of the things has just been to, to talk to them, to make sure that they're equipped with information generally. Um, we've done a lot around, um, you know, helping them to name their emotions. Um, I think that um, one of the things I read when I was a new mom was just this concept of we're always the ones behind the camera, that we're always taking the pictures, that we're not often in the pictures. And that's for a lot of different reasons. But um, I have prioritized having regular um, professional photo shoots. So we do one for Christmas cards every year. And then um, you know, I've told my husband, I don't want all the stuff for Mother's Day. I, I just want a photo shoot so that we have that record of them, you know, of me being in their, their life. Um, both of them are uh, very active children. Uh, they're both boys. And um, I was always very active with them prior to my diagnosis. And so that was a huge change because I was on crutches and then a walker um, you know, at wheelchair, that sort of thing, especially after my leg surgery. And, um, you know, energy is something that is not in short supply when you're in, in treatment and, um, and radiation is, it makes you so tired as well. I had radiation to my legs and to my back. And so having to adjust to not being active with them, but find other times of connection with them because I've had the ability to have more time with them because I'm not, you know, working and running around and having a million to do's. Um, I've been able to be a lot more intentional in spending individual time with them, you know, putting the electronics away. Um, we, I do a date with each of them once a week where we go out. It's usually for ice cream every week. Um, and, and now we've done this for years, uh, taking them out and just, had an individual conversation with them about whatever it is that comes to their their mind. Um, so just trying to be very intentional about being in the moment with them, um, about um, you know listening to them, trying to consider very carefully the lessons that um, I want to pass on to them. 
Um, I also have uh, memory boxes for them. So, um, because the, the likelihood of me being here, although we hope so, um, when they get married is, is low. And so, you know, not going to be able to have that dance with my son at his wedding, either of them. And so what I have tried to do in terms of channeling that um, emotion, channeling that energy is um, I sit down and write them a letter to open on their wedding day. Um, so I have a box full of, of letters for different times of, you know, cards for different times. Um, I came across the list. I, I don't even know where I, I came across it, but I came across the list of like all the times that you want to hear from your mom. Um, you know, you come back home after your, your first, you know, binge drinking or wake up with your first hangover, break up with your girlfriend for the first time, buy your first car, you know, all those, all those milestones and moments that it is unlikely that, that I'll be here for those. Um, I'm trying to have, you know, a card for them to open, um, you know, with my handwriting, with, you know, my reassurances and, and those kinds of things. Um, I think that the other thing that I'll say too is just the, I, I have realized over the last five years, not just with my kids, but with everybody that um, you have to say the things that are important. You have to say that you love people. You have to say that you care for them. You have to uh, verbalize those things because we, we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, saying the things that you need to get off of your heart, I think, is one of the big things that we've tried to do with the kids. And I've just tried to do with relationships in general, because you don't know what, what's going to happen. And I think those of us dealing with the serious illness, we have a little bit more of a, um, a sense of that, just because we have a serious diagnosis. But it could, I mean, somebody can die at any, at any point. I just try to be very intentional about about those things and about my legacy, about what, what I'm going to leave behind. 